Welcome to Offshore Explorer. I'm your host, Scott Dodgson. Today we're going to talk about checklists. Um, something we do in boating. And, of course, there are many other things. And we always want to have a pretty good checklist and check everything twice, etc., etc., etc. This is the time of year where you may be preparing to go south for the winter, especially those East Coast cruisers and sailors and heading out to, uh, to Bermuda and then down to the Caribbean for the winter. And then, of course, you return um, to our Aussie friends. You'd be heading north um, up into the, uh, the tropics. And um, it's just a time where a lot of boats are moving around, a lot of cruisers are moving around. And, you know, everybody has the same anticipation, you know, the great weather, um, great times, and, you know, in search of that perfect sundowner. But I kind of don't need to put down a checklist. I have had checklists in my brain almost to the point of uh, being completely overwhelmed by them. I used to make a checklist and, and, and for things that I needed to do, um, you know, projects I was going to take on. And so I would say, you know, okay, I've got to change this hose or I have to change this pump and I would start by saying okay and I should put some electric new electrical uh, wires down there I, I should put a terminal over here I need probably should change this hose but before I change that hose I should I should go to the, the board and put a new terminal in or find a new fuse or do this or do that and next thing you know there's like 57 other things that I needed to do before I could get to actually replacing that pump. Now, a lot of people have really simple boats. Um, there's not a lot that can go wrong. But there's a way to sort of look at it because I find that often uh, cruisers will come up and they'll tell me like, you know, oh yeah, I've been getting my boat prepared, you know, for the last 10 years. And I'm like completely baffled by that. Um, on the West Coast, uh, a lot of people are heading down to Mexico now. And, um, you know, it's an easy down. Uh, it's a bash back. Um, there was a time when parts were difficult to get for different um, different types of boats. But the world is... It's become pretty cool as far as delivery stuff. Um, I told a story about getting um, a heat exchanger in um, Antigua and having it shipped in, which is which is great. Um, but now you can Amazon almost anything anywhere in the world, um, or at least get something shipped and and not have to pay. A lot of dues or whatever, and in some cases, a lot of, you know, uh, small places have little small islands here and there, have some pretty good little uh, shops that you can pick up stuff. So the checklist essentially is to make sure everything is cool, and the, whatever that the coolness is, um, what you'll be prepared for a breakdown. But there's also sort of a mental checklist, I think, that's important. And I want to make the point today is that I think as as Western sailors, we have a tendency to go overboard. And, you know, there's there's a lot of stuff that you can buy. And, you know, not all of us have... Not all of us have a ton of money that uh, we can throw at it. Um, I uh, often joke about my my equipment buying history. Um, you know, when I was chartering, I, I, I was essentially making very good money, but um, I would um, I would be saving money to get the, the next big thing. I remember I needed to buy some new anchor chain. 
And I, I probably saved, um, oh, I don't know, probably three, four charters of, you know, small sums on the side before I could go and, and literally get this new anchor chain. And I remember I was in St. Martin and, um, St. Martin has some wonderful, uh, stores, uh, and ship stores that you can buy lots of stuff and, and it's all there and it's, you know, it's got to be shipped in. So it's a little bit more expensive, but I needed a very specific kind of link and um, I had to order it um, from Florida, so it had to be shipped shipped in. And I went through the whole process of buying it. But you know, this the whole idea was okay. How can I keep this chain clean? How can I, you know, not put too much stress on it? And so finally, I did buy uh, uh, some new chain, and I was, you know, that was like a big deal for me. Um, another thing is sales. I mean. You don't have to have perfect sales when you leave. Um, you know, sales have a pretty good life. Um, always check them out. Uh, make sure there's no rips, tears, or little holes. I had 150 uh, Genoa that um, was like my favorite downwind sail. Um, it was it was better than flying a spinnaker. This is it was as big as a spinnaker. And it was just a gorgeous, gorgeous, gorgeous sail. It would just stretch all the way back, um, almost to the stern of the boat. It was just so huge. And it was very lightweight. It ended up having a little tiny hole that I did not see and all that. And um, I happened to be eating a sandwich in the cockpit, and I looked up, and I saw the hole, and... Three seconds later, the whole sail just blew up and was in shreds. And that just broke my heart. But it was an old sail, and I knew it was an old sail, and I had tried to keep it in the best shape I could. So the checklist thing is, is there's things that are going to be marginal. So you have to think marginal, like, okay, how far can I get with this, or how far can I get with that? And then there's always something that's going to, you know, break. So there's always, you're always babying something. Now, a couple of things you really can't baby, um, for example, is your engine. That's just full-on maintenance. Um, One of the things that I always do, and I say these things because these are failures I've had over the years. Um, Just to put it in perspective, I don't think very many people will be sailing um, on a, um, a 60, 72 foot boat, um, close to 20,000 nautical miles a year for like 18, 18 years in a row. I don't think there's a lot of people that are going to be doing that. So there's a tremendous amount of stress that I personally would put on the equipment. And my maintenance schedule was, was very heavy. Um, and so there's a lot of things because, I'm essentially somewhat lazy, um, and I would go like, oh, yeah, i got to change the oil today. Mm-hmm. Next week, next week, it'll be okay. That oil is fine. It'll be okay. No worries. But one of the things that I have found that I kick myself for not doing when it happened was that my zincs on the engine um, would break off occasionally, and they would get caught and they would block the flow of the water through the engine. And so, you know, after that happened, it was like, okay, check the zincs all the time. So as a sailor, you know, with a diesel engine, um, especially gas engines, the same thing. And even when I was driving a big mega yacht, in this story, I'm going to touch on taking a Perini Navi um, 120, down to uh, Mozambique, and and even in even in those ships, essentially, um, you have to you know engine checks is something you do every day before you start anything, um, especially generators. Now I know a lot of my listeners don't have generators on their boats. Um, some do, um, and and you know, maybe you've opted to go into uh, solar or wind or whatever. But whatever the 
energy generating devices that you have, nine out of 10 times, it's going to be going to a battery. And so checking batteries and really keeping up on batteries and not compromising the battery time. Like I used to have, um, I had four 8D uh, gel cell batteries. That's big ones, the big golf cart batteries, not the little, not the little ones. And, um, and then I had uh, uh, two wet cell, like truck starting batteries, 8Ds, and then one separate battery for just starting the engine, which was a regular um, uh, wet cell battery. I had that all tied in. And I would constantly be checking the water and the batteries every day. I would constantly be, you know, top, topping them off because the systems you use, you know, there's a lot of stress. And these batteries, and I got to put it in today, batteries today are, are 100% better than they were even 20 years ago. Um, and just a small aside on batteries is, I asked my grandfather, who was born in 1900, um, he uh, was a very observant man, and he had um, he was a sports writer uh, in Philadelphia, and he had observed a lot of things. Um, and I asked him later in his life, um, he, he passed away at 87, um, I asked him later on in his life, I said, what technology impressed you the most in the world in your lifetime and his immediate answer wasn't computers it wasn't lights or jets or planes or whatever he said the, the thing that really impressed him most was the battery the fact that you could hold all this energy in this little package to him was the most amazing thing and battery development has been huge but it's a huge thing also on our checklist to make sure that it's kind of up and running and, and you know, put together well. So I used to create a whole system in my head, you know, what equipment I would do, um, how I would deal with this equipment, um, everything from the windlass to the boom to blocks to D-rings on the deck um, to the dinghy, um, to the galley, to propane, to everything. And I used to like drive myself insane. And then I was on this trip and it was a wonderful trip. Um, I was, I took, I took this Perini Navi and, um, the owner, it was sort of a test, um, to see if we would get along and we didn't, um, does, that's the end of that story. But he he keeps coming, Paulo keeps coming back to me and has for years and years and years um, to run his boats. And I tell him no because he's such an idiot. And um, But he's a very rich idiot. And um, he's, he's a nice man, but impossible to work for. Um, so, but he had this idea that, you know, I would take over temporarily his, his yacht. And we would go down to Mozambique. So we went down to Mozambique, sailed down down through the Suez Canal, and the Red Sea, and, you know, the whole thing, and up around Somalia, down all the way down, stopped in Kenya, um, and we sailed, we sailed the, the Indian Ocean side of the African coast. And we got down. Um, we did not stop at Madagascar, which I think was a mistake, um, but he didn't want to. He had been there before, and wasn't impressed with it and I kind of wanted to go there but anyway um, Mozambique was uh, just absolutely amazing and it relates to checklists um, because I saw a different kind of sailor and it made me feel like I was just you know I had a lot of unnecessary stuff that I didn't need to be a sailor and it gave me a perspective that was uh, new at the time. And I've, I've always kept it in my heart. And, and what it was is these sailors are sailing the Tao. Now, if you know anything about Tao, this episode will have a picture of the Tao on it. 
It's a lanteen sail. They're very shallow draft. Um, they they use um, in some cases um, coconut hair to make the lines, and that's what they tie things on with. Um, the sail was a very simple cotton type sail. You'll if you look at a lot of pictures of it, you'll see the sails look absolutely pitifully dirty. Um, and they are, um, because the way they get folded up on the boom, it's a giant boom that goes across the, um, the main and it is, it's just, the, it, 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 there's huge sails and they balloon out. Um, and because of the shallow draft, you can literally sail them right up onto the beach. Now, there's a lot of history with these dowels and um, you know some have claimed that they were inspired by the Portuguese and I just want to say this um, folks it, you're going to find that a lot of details and facts you get about history all seem to start the world seemed to start with the first Western explorers the Portuguese, da Gama, okay? That's that's where it started. Like, that's, that's completely wrong. This sort of Western egocentric view of the world. Um, if you get out into the world, into these different places, you will find that the world does just fine without the Western world's ideas, okay? They do great. And there's no real evidence to say that the Portuguese influenced boat builders in Mozambique to build a caravel slash type of dhow. That's just, that's just the white man has arrived and he'll show you how to do everything in life. And that's just, that's, that's that kind of history you have to be aware of because when you get to these places, you realize that this has been going on. Dows have been sailing, and they've been using the lines of made or coconut. Um, the 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 stuffing um, between the planks of the of the boat are are, are cloth um, can be cotton. Um, very much very similar to what we use. They expand. They're covered sometimes with tar. Um, sometimes they're just, uh, they get some sort of this sort of, um, um, goo that they make from plants. They crush it up and they get this goo, this sticky glue. And, and these boats, I mean, if you knew how they were built, you may not ever step in one, at least on the water, but they're beautiful boats and they sail amazing. And a lot of them don't have engines. And for a thousand years at least, okay, I mean, they have been going back and forth across the Indian Ocean and the Arabian Peninsula um, shipping goods. Um, there's a lot of stories about, um, you know, Iran and Iraq in, in that part of the world and that if you had a Dow, nobody would bother you. And they were shipping tea and flour and animals and chickens. I mean, everything. And that's what they did. They would sail. Now, a lot of the, the heavier um, sailing dowels um, were, uh, they used to transport large animals. There's a story about um, in 1414, a uh, Swahili dhow um, shipped a giraffe to the Chinese emperor. A giraffe on a boat. <laughs> Think about it. It's got to be crazy. But there's, they built the dhows uh, in a lot of places. One of the places that they built the dhows is a place that I really love. It's called Kerala, um, which is in India. And they have great forests. Obviously, you have to have wood for a boat. And um, they used to make this the really good rope, um, and they had a lot of skilled uh, shipwrights. And they would build the um, the dow, and they would hold together the planks with the coconut rope. 
and then they would go and they'd sail all over the place. So if you're sitting, if you're sitting at home and you're planning your next voyage, right? And you're sitting there and go, oh, I can't, I, I, I can't leave until I get that new chart plotter. I really got to have that chart plotter. Um, you know, I can't go out of the harbor without that chart plotter and that GPS and all the rest of this stuff. Here are people sailing all over the Indian Ocean with no chart plotters, coconut rope holding together the, the wood of the boat, sails made of cotton, rough cotton at that, and, and, and they're sailing um, using, you know, traditional navigation. Um, they use this uh, thing which is like a square board with a wire, a line, okay? And what they would do is, is they would just measure the, the angle of the sun to the sea. It's called a kamala. And it would determine the latitude and, and they would do this by finding the angle of the pole star just above the horizon. And that, that's a very simple, simple, simple way to, to and they still use this, this Kamala. And um, it's, so every time you stop yourself from going out, sailing or cruising, or you can't do this because you don't have this equipment, just kick your head back into this thing. These people are sailing around all over the Indian Ocean, and it's a big Indian Ocean. And they're moving goods, and they're having fun. And these sailors are really salt of the earth kind of people, and they're very knowledgeable about wind, about wave. They have this sort of inherent um, connection with the ocean, and it just makes me. Uh, it made me at the time, especially when I was in Mozambique, like, oh, these are some serious people. This is some serious stuff. And I have been taking myself too serious about all the equipment I need. I can't, I can't leave port without my, the oil in my generator changed. Well, I can. I just don't use the generator. Um, but it, I'm just saying this is so there's a kind of a perspective that you need to have. So there's the next level, which is actually preparing yourself. And there's a couple of things that I think are important before you go and you take off and cruise. Um, I think you need to train yourself. Um, the, one of the key things about training yourself is not only your knowledge of sailing, your uh, experience in handling the boat, but you have to take into perspective that sailing is a, an experience-based uh, activity. Um, all the technical knowledge that you could read in books is not going to, is going to take you just so far, but really it's experience that you need in order to be successful and to have a comfortable journey. Now, one of the best things to do is to think about it from your own psychology. First of all, you know, be prepared and this will help you minimize stress. Now, if you're jumping in your boat, depending on the size of your boat, whether it's a little boat, big boat, whatever the case may be, you're kind of moving with your own home, so to speak. So you've got, you know, it's different than say, you're going to climb Mount Everest where you have to carry everything on your back. No, everything's laid out for you. But it's important to psychologically um, feel as though you are prepared. The next thing is, is to visualize yourself. Think about how you're going to do your trip. You know, visualize, let's say, for example, you're leaving Marina del Rey in California, okay? Visualize the trip in your head all the way down the Baja, say to go to Cabo or Puerto Vallarta um, or even beyond. Just visualize that. You know, what things you're going to see, where you're going to get fuel. You make that plan in your head where you can see it. And prepare yourself for a different sort of living condition. Now, I think a lot of people sort of go for the idea 
that there's going to be some disaster. You're going to be in a force five hurricane and it's going to be crazy. And that's the whole trip is going to be at that level. When in fact, sailing over a very, very long distance, once you get everything set and you have a good steady, steady wind, you know, and waves and all the rest of that stuff can be really delightful. You can read a book, you can listen to radio or listen to music. Um, I had the, the great fortune <laughs> Back when there was DVDs, I had a guest on board. And she was like the executive vice president at um, um, where was it? not Sony um, um, at uh, Universal Studios. Um, she was like above the movie people and ran the parks and all the rest of this kind of stuff. And she's an absolutely crazy and wonderful woman. And she put me on a, a list um, that they I receive uh, DVDs for all their films. So every time a film came out, I would get a package, and there'd be all these you know remastered uh, movies, and 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 it was just great. I I ended up getting like three four hundred movies on the boat, all DVDs. Not much use right now, but um, it was it was like very cool because we could sail along. I mean, you have to imagine I'm, I'm doing two crossings a, a year, okay? And that's like two months worth of sailing. And doing that, it's great to be able to throw in a movie you haven't seen and, and, and watch it while you're sailing. I used to sit in, sit in the companionway steps, you know, and scan the horizon just to see if there are any ships, watch the sails, watch, you know, sail along in 15, 20 knot wind, um, just clip it along and watch TV and watch a movie up there. You know, it was great. So be ready to sort of have some basic living, you know, conditions and ease yourself in, make a couple of trips. Um, and understand this, if you go out and sail, say 24 hours, um, you know, I have done this. I've been, I've gone out with people that, uh, were a little unsure of themselves. Um, and I was there just to help them with their confidence. And we would go out sailing and we'd come back, you know, we'd go out and sail all night, turn around, come back. And um, they would get used to that kind of sailing. And, and what they realized is that even though they're in a warm climate, it gets cold at night. So prepare for that. And if you're sitting in the cockpit um, and you've got the auto helm on, a very important piece of equipment to check. Um, you know, it can get fresh. It can be hard to keep your eyes open. But there's all sort of little strategies you can do to keep doing that. And that's something you have to prepare on your own. Um, me, I I love coffee, so I would drink some coffee. Um, I'd eat Starbursts. I'd have fresh apples. Um, in my coffee, I would put Baileys, so I got that kind of mix. And um, I would just, you know eat, I would snack just to keep my blood sugar up. That way I wouldn't fall asleep and um, not eat too much, um, drink plenty of water. And um, that way I could keep my head up and also get used to the routine. You know, your body and your mind know when you're moving and they don't relax very much when they're moving. But sailors get used to it, and discover the ability to relax. I am always accused of, of being able to fall asleep at the drop of a hat and then wake up refreshed after three, four hours. Um, it drives um, everyone crazy around me um, that I don't need to do that. The other thing is, is try to make your nighttime, as I'm saying, enjoyable. Um, you know, like, you know, watching a movie, um, listening to different stuff. Once on a trip from uh, New York City down to um, the Caribbean, I had a little uh, transistor radio um, that was sort of a short wave, you know, one of those combination radios. And I was picking up the World Series um, was in Toronto, in the Phillies. I'm from Philly, so I'm a Phillies fan. 
um, which they lost that series. And here I am. I am. I'm like 50 miles from Bermuda, and I'm listening to the radio um, and listening to the World Series. Um, it's just fun. You know, it's just something you want to do. The other thing is, is to stay healthy on a boat. Um, there's a lot, because of the movement, you're using a lot of energy just to sit upright sometimes. Um, sometimes you got to lodge yourself in between one bulkhead and another bulkhead just to keep yourself, you know, from falling, you know, over and killing yourself. Um, sometimes you're on deck and it's so wet and it's just very uncomfortable and, you know, you get water down underneath your, um, you know, your gear and you're uncomfortable and you're cold and blah, blah, da, 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 da. But you got to be able to find a kind of space um, where you can be comfortable. And one of the things that I've always found to personally make me comfortable or at least to help me is I always had a couple of dry towels um, tucked away so that when I came down below after a really wet night and all the rest of that kind of stuff, I could throw some fresh water on my face and I could wipe myself off with a towel. And that just, for some reason, it just psychologically made me so much more happy. Um, it just seemed to work better for some reason. Because a lot of times, and this is cruising, it's not so much like anchored. Because in anchored, you're just basically living your life. It's pretty much the same you know, you have to watch how much water you use, etc. But, you know, you can take showers. You can do this. I mean, I used to take showers on the aft of my boat. Um, first, I would take a, a bucket. You should always have a what I like to call my big red bucket and a line that you can toss in, throw some uh, salt water over yourself, lather up. Um, fun to do with your girlfriend or wife. Um, get all soapy and and uh, rinse yourself off with the salt water, wash everything, and then turn your shower on, a deck shower, or use fresh water for just a quick burst. And you, you'll end up using less than a gallon, and you'll be super fresh and feel really like you know, you're on top of the world. So that's part of staying healthy. You have to eat healthy. Um, you're going to suffer from uh, sleep deprivation in a certain way, um, but over time, you kind of get used to it. Another thing is to have a few things from home, comforts from home. Now, I don't know what that would be for you, but here's kind of the thing. If I see somebody that's just using paper plates, styrofoam cups, and all the rest of this kind of jazz, and I'm thinking, okay, that's nice if they're saving what. Um, you know, say, to save water, but you can wash all your stuff in salt water. Many boats have a foot pump that'll allow salt water to come into your sink. You can wash all your stuff and then you can rent, rinse it off real fast with fresh water. Um, I like having silverware. I like having plates. I like having, you know, glassware. Now, not for out sailing, sailing, right? Um, you know, hard day on a hard tack um getting pounded by the waves no but when you you go to anchor and you open up your uh cockpit table and you put your your food out there try to make it as elegant as possible you know enjoy your meal taste it the food tastes so much better another thing you might consider also is to sort of build up your uh resilience um, it's, it's kind of important that you practice being on the deck, walking on the deck, uh, working the sails. Um, and it's important, especially for couples. And this is directly to the guys. Let your wife do the shit, you know, let her, let her control the boat. She has to be as good a captain as you are. And maybe in some cases even better, um, because you're going to be somewhat stronger um, you're the one that's going out on a foredeck. If you have a rip sail and you have to struggle with getting a furler down or whatever the case may be, that's what you're going to do. 
Um, you're not going to send your wife out there to do it, although I've known people to do that. Um, and that's not being misogynistic at all. I'm just saying that that both both co- a couple needs to be able to to share the workload and everything equally. Um, you have to be able to anchor and handle the boat completely, 100%. And in order to do that, you need to practice. You need to go out and do it. Um, I used to, uh, when I was teaching captains uh, or mates to be captains, to, to, to helm a specific kind of, like, say, power boat or something, which, you know, there's this whole concept, oh, what's the largest boat you think you could handle? Um, there isn't a boat that I don't think I can handle, to be quite honest, because it's all the same principles. It's just a little bit different way of working it. Um, I used to take the boat, and no matter what boat it was, and I'd, I'd drive right up to a buoy, I'd stop, I'd back up, I'd come around, and I'd try to keep the bow on the buoy um, and just do a whole compass all the way around, north to, se- north, north to south, up and down, stern to the buoy, bow to the buoy, side two to the buoy, and just get out there and practice. You can do this in, in a harbor, and, you know, no, nobody's to the wiser. And it's really good practice for your boat handling. Because um, boat handling, and just a quick aside, is I thought I handled boats pretty well. Um, I have, have driven uh, as large a boat as a 260-foot um mega yacht with a helicopter on the back um and i've driven really small boats um but i got more boat handling experience and feel when i ran vessel assist out of marina del rey and i had to put a sailboat or power boat on my hip of a boat that had a very tiny rudder and was a fixed prop um and I had to learn how to maneuver that boat um, using the engine, um, taking the prop out of the equation, all the time with another boat tied to the side. And I learned how to do that. And I got more feel for how to handle a boat doing something like that than I could have ever imagined. And um, that's just, you know, you pick stuff up as you're going. And a few other things, too, is... A couple of tips um, uh, for a female on the boat. There, you know, it's guys can sort of, you know, go to the bathroom easier than women, as we all know. Um, So prepare yourself for that, Um, you know, especially if you're going down below. And a lot of people get nauseous when they go down below to go to the bathroom. And uh, the lucky, the the thing is, is you have a, you have a toilet um, you can use that, um, do the best you can. Um, you may want to have some sort of pee bottle if you don't want to go below, um, if it's too much. These are little things that you're going to have to think through for yourself. Um, never put tampons in the toilet, whatever you do. That's always been a, a hard and fast rule for anybody that's sailing. Um, and I guess the key thing is, is the checklist itself, and I'm going to go through it really kind of quickly um, because I don't think, I think we all know what we need to have on the boat and we all know what we should do or not do as far as uh, testing the equipment and training the crew because training the crew is really key if you're going for a big uh, trip. Um, You know, life jackets and harnesses, okay? Okay. The whole time I sailed in the Caribbean and many, many crossings, I never put on a life jacket or a harness. Um, Sometimes I did. I don't just put it on only when the weather was sort of dicey. Um, It's probably not the best thing, but I couldn't see sitting in 90-degree weather under a nice sail with a cocktail in my hand and a a life jacket on. Uh, Just... It just didn't fit my personality or or what I was going to do. But, I mean, I get it. I get why people would wear that. And, oh, yeah, the gloves. I never got the gloves thing. But, anyway, 
Um, make sure you find out who the non-swimmers on, are on your boat. Okay, that's really key too. Um, if you're going to be in heavy weather and stuff, obviously, highly recommend harnesses, life jackets, the whole kit and caboodle. Um, also, make sure that you have a, a, a getaway bag, all right, a ditch bag. Now, I, I'm kind of, I think it's a good idea. But in practical matters, I had a ditch bag and... I never used it. I never, and that's sort of the object, but I never even opened it up. I mean, I went for years where I would look at it and go like, oh, well, what's in here anyway? And and it would be, you know, there would be some water, some protein bars, there would be uh, flares, whistles, um, lights, um, flashlights, um, uh, EPIRB kind of stuff, Um I just completely lost track of it, and it wasn't anything that was very interesting at all, as far as I was concerned. But I guess it was there if I needed it. The next thing is fire extinguishers. Um, fire extinguishers are always like the last thing that people check, um, and they're going to be the first thing they want to use if they have a fire. So, you know, if you're going on a cruise, make sure you get those uh, all the fire extinguishers either fired up and replenished or new. Um, make sure your flare, you've got your flares, your EPIRB, all the rest of that stuff. You know, this should be easy stuff. It should be, you know, there it is, constant check, keep going, don't even, don't even stop. And, and make sure it's registered and all the rest of that kind of jazz. And, and, and check it. Um, go back and recheck it and keep doing it. In terms of life rafts, um, when I was sort of running some big uh, mega yachts, we would always have a time um, in which the life rafts had to be taken apart and repacked. And these are big um, eight-man, in some cases, 16-man life rafts. Um, I would go out to an anchorage with the crew, and we would do fire drills. Um, we would take, uh, we'd get out the fire hoses, and we would do the drill you know, running the fire hose, the crew would have their positions. They'd, they'd put on their, their masks uh, and all the rest of the stuff. We'd do the whole thing. And then, as fun, we would, we would uh, launch the uh, life rafts, and we would make a party of it because they would blow out. They're really cool to watch. And they would just get in the water and get really big. And everybody would have to swim to them. And, and, and you get put the dry suits on. And you're in the water with the dry suits floating around. And everybody gets experience in doing this. That way, when something disastrous happens, um, people are familiar. Your crew is familiar with it. And, and the life raft's got to be repacked anyway. So they're going to op be opened anyway. So you just send them to the packer, um, the servicer, and he'll pack them all back up for you. And, you know, it saves him a step of having to take it apart. Another thing that I'm really keen on is first aid. Um, I know for a captain's license, you have to take a course in first aid. This is important. Um, I had the um, fortune of uh, being trained in the military in, in what they call field surgical medicine. Um, it was a part of a larger, you know, I was a, a, a ranger in the, in the 82nd Airborne. Um, we used to do a lot of different kinds of things. And one of the training was is to go get medical training to be a medic, but Essentially, you can take the next step. I really would love to see people take their first aid course and the practice of their first aid more seriously and get used to it. Um, I have had experiences. Uh, I had a friend of mine on another boat during a hurricane. Um, she lost her finger when it got caught um, on a line, and the line just cut her finger off. And... Uh, the, her husband at the time saw the blood, saw the finger on the deck, and he couldn't do anything. He just, something in him just clicked. And he, he was just panicked and he couldn't do anything. And she was like, you know, obviously in shock. And I had to hop over there 
and get some bandages on her, preserve her finger. Um, we put her finger in ice and stuff. And after the hurricane, we got her to the hospital. And she actually um, ended up going to uh, Miami to to have her finger sewed back on. Um, it didn't happen because it was too much time. Um, but, you know, we made the effort. We were there. And I think first aid training so that you're ready to go. Um, another first aid thing is um, I had... Uh, uh, I was on a race boat uh, out actually in San Diego and um, the owner of the boat stood up as we were tacking and got hit in the side of the head by the boom, which was like the dumbest move I've ever seen anybody make. Um, but, you know, checking that out, making sure your crew knows where the boom is, right? I mean, I mean, it's sort of obvious, but, you know, you could do it in a kind of clever way, like, you know, bring the boom over to midships and then have everybody in the cockpit standing up and stuff and just kind of pretend to show them. So they get a visual idea of if this boom comes around, you better duck, you better not be standing up on this boom. Now I've had people actually, um, uh, flaking the mainsail and tr struggling with getting a sail in a windy a situation and have the boom just quickly because of a, a wave or a swell snap over and hit them in the chest and they almost get you know they almost fell overboard i've had that happen to me tons of times um but i've always been prepared to wrestle with the boom and i'm, I'm not talking like huge booms i'm you know even if you have a small boat it's something you have to do have to be paying attention to but first aid's a real key thing. Um, I've seen people, uh, you know, just come with a Band-Aid box, essentially. And I'm just astounded. I think you need to go and buy a really solid first aid kit. Uh, first Med um, is a company that makes them. The guy who runs the company is a Navy SEAL. He knows what he's doing, um, and he's packed everything in there. Because there's nothing worse, for example... Then having a toothache, a tooth that really, like losing a filling and having a toothache, it's just killing you. And there's nothing in the first aid kit to help that pain. You know? Um, broken bones. Happens on boats all the time. Um, I had a friend who broke his shoulder, his, 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 dislocated his shoulder because uh, the Genoa, um, luffed up and snapped and and hit him in the shoulder as he was wrestling with it. It hit him so hard it broke his shoulder. Amazing. It was a big boat, but it was, there's a lot of power in the wind and stuff. So, you know, take your first aid seriously. Go take a course. Um, keep up to date on it. You know what to do when somebody has a heart attack. Know what, you know, just know these things. Um, you know, do your man overboard that's another thing, okay? Um, I used to always have to do it uh, because my hat would fly off my head or a guest's hat would fly. Oh, that's my favorite hat. And so I'd have to do the old Williamson turn and come back, keep your eye on the hat, you know, have a deck member, you know, keep pointing to the hat, keep pointing to the hat. There it is, there it is. And, and, and you can maneuver the boat and get the sails down and all the rest and come back and pick up the hat. Um, that's great. That's great exercise for the crew to do. And it's fun. Another thing is the stove. Okay. Make sure you have your prop propane bottles secure. Um, double check them. Um, you'll find as you're getting propane filled up around the world that there's a lot of different um, attachments to fill up propane depending on where you are. And it could be a, somewhat of a pain in the ass. Um, so you might need adapters, um, but this is something you're going to have to do some research on. Um, the other thing is, is, you know, make sure that for your stove that the um, um, the kill switch, um, you know, works. And, um, you know, don't, uh, you know, don't leave the gas on. Make sure the gas switch is off when you're sailing. 
Um, you know, this is an important thing. Another thing that I've always done, which might help you thinking of stuff in the kitchen, um, a lot of people have a problem with, uh, you know, they w putting stuff down and watching it slide all around. Um, a real trick is to put a damp um, uh, dish towel, just damp, okay, um, on a surface, and then you could put cups and, and dishes and plates and stuff on that, and they won't slide around. Just think about that for a second. The other thing is to check your heads. Um, a very important thing. Um, a lot of uh, heads, you know, or have valves. Make sure the valves are serviced. And, in fact, all the valves. You should service all your valves on a regular basis. Now, most of the time, you would service your valves, <laughs> your valves, your valves when um, you've got the boat hauled out. Um, they're all ball valves, you know, do a little research, get it visually in your head, what they are, you know, move the handles back and forth, make sure that they're all in the right position. Um, and, and then this is something that essentially happened to me was I had a guy come in to fix the air conditioning on the boat and he had opened and closed valves all over the boat, trying to figure out where the water intake, um, the, the salt water intake was for the generator. Um, and I wasn't actually on the boat to show him at the time. I was doing something else. And he had left a valve open. And that valve um, had a pipe that came up off the valve and went straight up the side. And it went nowhere. It was just an empty pipe. There had been... Um, I don't know what it was that was there from before. I had no idea. It was just this spare valve right through hull valve and and hose that ran up into underneath uh, the cabinetry and I had no idea where it went to or what it was used for and um, he left that one open and while sailing um, and I was healed over that pipe just uh, filled up with water and water and water and more water um, and it was just, it was, it almost sunk me. And, um, you know, I, I heard sloshing down the stairs and I went down to see and there was like two feet of water. And it was all from this, this, um, uh, being on a single tack with this pipe, um, uh, just, uh, spewing water. So it's really, really important to check this sort of stuff. Um, that's important. Check period. Make sure you check your um, bilge pumps and show your crew how they work. Um, off on switches, uh, manual, automatic, constantly check those. I That was something I did almost on a daily basis. But these are just some of the little things that we're, you know, looking to do or what you should be looking at doing. Um, there's lots of good checklist stuff out there. Um, and that's kind of a, a fun thing to kind of go through. Remember that there's always a compromise on new equipment. Don't, don't let not having the right equipment keep you from going out sailing and doing a long cruise. And that's it for today. I want to thank uh, everybody for listening. Um, special kudos to Paulette McWilliams. Her new album um, out there is uh, A Woman's Story. Um, you can pick it up anywhere you pick up your music. Uh, we endeavor that you listen to it. There's tons and tons of things to um, to talk about. Um, we have, as some of you know, um, I've, I'm have i putting together a book. Um, I'm doing another book with some of the stories that I've done. Um, hopefully, I will have that out before the end of the year. And um, we're working on a TV show which is going to be super exciting. Um, my pleasure. Thank you for listening. Um, this is uh, Offshore Explorer with Scott Dodgson wishing you uh, fair winds and calm seas. <laughs>